Un segundo, permitidme que me pase al inglés en motivo de este episodio. Hi everybody, we usually make videos in Spanish language, but today we have Linda Hayes in our channel, so we'll be speaking in English with subtitles in both languages. Linda is one of the most well-known behavioral psychologists on the current landscape. She's a self-declared interbehaviorist and will be telling us about interbehaviorism, main differences with radical behaviorism and other kinds of behaviorisms, a brief comparison on Cantor and Skinner, and much, much else. Stay with us and enjoy this trip through such amazing and complex points of view on psychology. As always, we remember that you can find our online courses and therapy service on our website and grammapsychologia.es. We also have a brand new Telegram group for you to discuss topics on psychology and get informed about our latest news. That's it, have a good one, ciao, ciao. Uh, well, I'm uh, Linda Hayes. Um, I, uh, I, I go sometimes by Linda Parrott Hayes, which was my maiden name. Um, and I, um, I got my doctoral degree at Western Michigan University, working with Jack Michael. And uh, I have worked at West Virginia University and also at a university in Halifax, Canada. But for the last 32 years, I've been at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I have very recently retired. Presentamos el servicio de terapia online en Grama, comprometidos con la asistencia basada en evidencia científica de manera rigurosa y personalizada a tus necesidades. Para recibir más información, contáctanos por web, redes sociales o WhatsApp. All right. Okay, uh, so first thing we would like to, to ask you is that uh, how do you define interbehaviorism and what are the key concepts to understand this philosophy? Uh, interbehaviorism is a philosophy of science, not just of um, psychology as a science, but of other sciences. It's a way of looking at um, nature Um, it, uh, in psychological perspective, it's, uh, uh, what has to be understood is, um, what the focus of study is. It's a function of responding with respect to stimulating, occurring through a medium, uh, that is, uh, taking place in a, in a setting. And it is a, it, it is a, all of that combined is a, an integrated field. It's a field construction, which means that everything is related to everything in that circumstance. Okay. And which are the main points in common and discrepancies between interbehaviorism and other behaviorisms like radical or contextual behaviorism? Um, well, um, contextual behaviorism is derived from uh, radical behaviorism. Okay, so I'll start with radical behaviorism, Skinner's radical behaviorism. Um, it is a, uh, Skinner's radical behaviorism is a kind of causal philosophy. In other words, um, various environmental circumstances, um, are responsible for the occurrence of behavior. And once behavior occurs, other environmental circumstances are responsible in a causal way for the continuation of that behavior. So there's kind of a linear causal um, understanding of behavior. Um, that circumstances, uh, you know, the units of radical behaviorism are uh, operants, operant classes. Uh, that are defined by behaviors of various topographies that produce the same consequence. So operant behavior is what uh, Skinner was interested in. And, but operant behavior just described in terms of antecedent stimuli, responses and consequences uh, ended up having to be um, 
you know, um, various other features of that situation had to be added, uh, motivating variables, um, deprivation, aversive stimulation, things of that sort. Also, the larger context uh, in which behavior was occurring. So it's kind of um, a circumstance in which there is a causal relationship between stimuli and responses that is occurring under certain conditions of the organism and a setting, um, uh, a, a context of some sort. Um, what radical behaviorism didn't um, uh, didn't identify are certain aspects of that situation. Uh, principally, it did not differentiate a stimulus as an object from the a stimulus as a function. So the concept of stimulus function as separate from an object means that any given object may be home to multiple different functions. And all those functions are not just things out there in the world, they are relation with responding. So all kinds of complex human behavior, um, well, all kinds of animal behavior, but human behavior being even more complex by, by virtue of uh, linguistic functions. Um, in order to describe the complexities of human behavior, remembering, thinking, planning, dreaming, um, you know, uh, all of these kinds of things, you need the concept of stimulus function as distinct from stimulus, stimulus object. And what radical behaviorism didn't have that uh, construction. Uh, and it has made the understanding of complex human behavior uh, from Skinner's perspective, um, somewhat, um, uh, somewhat reliant on biology. Like we have these private events and all these complex things are inside the organism in some way. And that's how we account for thinking and remembering and all of that. Uh, because there was no way to talk about it otherwise. But there's no psychological events inside the organism. Uh, there are aspects of the organism, and those are biological aspects. It's only in the interaction of the organism with the environment they can talk about a psychological event. So radical behaviorism just really couldn't, couldn't adequately deal with complexities without becoming reductionistic to biology. Contextual behavior science adopted the stimulus function as distinct from stimulus object, um, that construction. And that really came from Cantor's uh, notions and earlier thinkers uh, uh, at the time that Cantor was writing those distinctions. And so contextual behavior science has this um, construction of a stimulus function, <laughs> but it also is a causal system based on radical behaviorism. So Cantor system has, of course, this distinction between stimuli and uh, functions and stimulus objects. And it is a field construction, an integrated field construction. So there's no causality in it. Nothing makes anything else happen. And psychological events don't exist inside the organism. So they're quite they're all sort of related and that they all want to talk about the natural world. They're not sort of deliberately mentalistic or anything. Uh, but they, Dr. Skinner's, um, Skinner's position is reductionistic and contextual behavior science is kind of mixed up. It's not really one or the other. And so, so I prefer interbehaviorism. <laughs> the Okay, uh, sorry. Mm, you have talked about the definition of, of behavior, not the, the unit of analysis um, of psychology, no? uh, but what are the main implications for defining behavior as a relationship instead of taking the Skinnerian definition uh, to understand behavior and this, um, this relationship with the experimental work? Well, um, all experimentation is really kind of the same process, really. 
In other words, you have sort of some sort of contained environment. And there are all kinds of things in that setting and in that circumstance as a field of interaction. And you change something, you add something to that environment, or you take something out of that environment and you see how it reconfigures as something else. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer to think of it as sort of reconfiguring, not that that thing that you took out made made the environment something that, that made behavior happen or that, that thing you added made the behavior happen, but rather that it is an integrated field. And so if you take something out of it or put something into it, you change the field, you change the event. So mm -hmm. in a, from a standpoint of uh, basic experimentation, it's sometimes useful to identify how you change the event. And it's not really too much of, too much of a problem just to call that a cause. Mm -hmm. But it's that, that way of that terminology is, is useful in that particular environment. It's causal thinking is not useful beyond a, um, a, a specific set of circumstances in which you're manipulating behavior. Um, so I, you know, I knew that the inner behaviorism was kind of criticized because, oh, well, it didn't have any basic research and it didn't have any application. Uh, but um, but inner behaviorism is a philosophy, <laughs> you know, it's not a it's not a set of experimental procedures. It could certainly talk about experimentation. You know, it doesn't doesn't need its own uh, apparatus or something to be a uh, value to science. So it's kind of misunderstood as it's criticized for things that it isn't. I mean, that they don't have anything to do with it. Does this um, uh, have uh, um, an impact uh, in the way we think um, we approach the experimental work? And I think about the the time variable. Yeah. Uh, and this relationship uh, in time, no, between uh, stimulus and and, yeah. and response and that is is that correct? Well, um, yeah, ordinarily, from a behavioral standpoint, uh, first the stimulus happens, and then the response happens, and then another stimulus happens. So there's a sort of temporal relations that we're talking about, but. Uh, from an interbehavioral perspective, the, the stimulus doesn't happen first and then the response because there is no stimulus without a response. There's no response that isn't related to a stimulus. So it doesn't, these are these stimulus response consequence. It's a, it's a, um, kind of an abbreviated way of talking about it because the stimulus of a light and the bar pressing and the, and the food pellet, The light is not just a light, it's a, it's a seeing of the light, you know? And the par press is not just something the paw does, it does it with respect to an apparatus. And the food is not something that just shows up, it's, it, it is, it's the eating of the food. So each of those elements is, a, is an interaction. And as soon as, as soon as seeing the light happens, When the, by the time you press the bar, seeing of the light is now part of that context. Seeing of the light is part of pressing the bar. And as soon as you press the bar and, and receive the food, you know, eating the food, seeing the light and pressing the bar are part of the situation of eating the food. So, you know, it's, it, the, the past keeps accumulating with, with the present. So there's kind of always a present circumstance. Hmm. And the past is really, um, like there's, there's no memory stored inside of you. So where is the past? Well, it's in the field. It's in the setting. It's um, um, how, how you remember something is that the setting is configured in such a way that you're interacting with functions of stimuli that you interacted with before at an, at an earlier present time, sort of. So, <coughs> there's a different conceptualization of time, actually. Mm. Right. 
There is a, a strong community of interbehaviorists in Mexico, for example. We know yeah. other behavior interbehaviorists uh, from other countries, some of them in Spain. But uh, what's the reach of interbehaviorism nowadays at the universities and academics? What's, what's the status of interbehaviorism nowadays? Um, well, um, you know, I know of the interbehaviorists in Mexico, they're working with Amelia Rivas and others there. And um, um, I know the, uh, the interest in Spain, and there, I know there's interest in Peru. Um, and there's not an awful lot of interest in the United States. Um, Cantor didn't, um, Cantor was a professor, you know, at a university and he had some students, uh, but those students uh, for the most part didn't go out to other universities and develop students and etc. cetera. Um, so I think um, it just hasn't been taught very much, but um, you know, my students are, um, are out there now and um, they've had uh, um, good interbehavioral training, read a lot of Cantor's books, and and I'm just hoping that they'll be continue to teach interbehaviorism to their students. Um, but it, um, you know, sort of causal thinking is really so dominant um, that that when you when you when you talk about a integrated field that isn't a kind of a cause of something that everybody gets kind of worried about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. um, do you think that the, the conception of interbehaviorism is going to change in the future? Um, the conception that, that have the, the students, the psychologists? Yeah, uh, it might. Um, it's... Um, Uh, because interbehaviorism as a philosophy is not restricted to psychological events, but can be applied to biological events, chemical events, social, sociological events, cultural events, that kind of thing. Uh, I think that I think that this sort of field notion, this integrated field notion, may show up in other domains more, like in biology. In biology, you know, they used to study the cardiac system, but then it turned out that that was related to something else, which was related to something else, related to something else. So you, you just couldn't really study one system. It didn't make sense. And so there, there's a kind of integrated field notion there. And the same thing about sort of cultural circumstances, too. So I think interbehaviorism is, as a philosophy, is likely to be present in a lot of different uh, other, um, a lot of, Uh, other um, disciplines, a lot of other sciences. Um, but um, in those other sciences, there's likely to be some drift because, um, because the scientists themselves are individuals. They're individual people with individual histories brought up as causal thinkers. And that You know, unless you have a an interbehavioral psychologist, a naturalistic psychologist who can talk about things like thinking and remembering and dreaming, uh, things of those sorts, who can understand observation, understand co construct development, understand theory, uh, then you're likely to get some drift, um, some drift in uh, the uh, the potential that an interbehavioral thinking would have in other disciplines. Cantor always uh, said that um, you know you 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 need a valid philosophy and a valid psychology in order to understand the world. So I think there's likely to be some drift there. But I think whatever does happen will be valuable. Talking about Cantor, how was he personally? Oh. <laughs> He was great. Um, when I was a graduate student at Western Michigan, he lived in Chicago, which was a couple hours away. And I visited him on several occasions. And um, toward the end of his life, he was quite deaf. And he had a kind of 
when I went to interview with him, talk to him, he had a sort of apparatus where I spoke into a microphone, into a speaker, and then he had a headset on. So, you know, I was speaking, you know, in into a speaker to a to a headset that he could hear. So we had good conversations, um, uh, and he was very um, he was very nice. He was very charming, very um, you know, very um, thoughtful. You know, very. Wanting to be helpful and and very in however he could, uh, he was delighted to have good conversation, and so I really enjoyed visiting him. I asked him one time. Um, he said, "Well, um, how do you feel that you don't have a, a lot of uh, followers? You don't have a lot of students and followers of your work." And he said. Um, he said uh, uh, something like um, that he was his own best critic of his work. In other words, mm -hmm. he could he could you know could develop his own work um, on his own uh, as a critic of his own work. <clears throat> and and he said, I said, well, when do you think people will be, appreciate your work? And I was visiting him in the seventies late seventies. And he said, he didn't think people would really appreciate interbehaviorism for another 50 years. So we're kind of on the 50 year mark. From there. <laughs> so I don't know. I think the students who get um, my own students here at, at University of Nevada, Reno, um, I think they, um, when they finally do uh, understand interbehaviorism, I think that they're very much changed. And I think it changes the way they look at the world uh, and their work. So it's a prof profound um, learning experience to be in touch with it. And I wish more people hmm. had the opportunity to study it and think about it. And Eskine, which is your opinion about him? How was he personally? Well, Skinner, he was a little bit more of a, um, I don't know what to say, really. Skinner had a lot of followers, and um, a lot of people, you know, wanted to befriend him and be around him. And he was, um, um, he, he wasn't, Cantor was a very modest person. And Skinner was not very modest in that regard. He was, uh, he was, um, I don't know. He, he, he liked an audience better. Hmm. <laughs> he, he was more comfortable with, with yes, that. Yes, definitely, yeah. With great audiences. Yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. He liked, uh, he liked giving <laughs> talks and having people clap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I should say she was more popular. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, do you think interbehaviorists and radical behaviorists can understand each other? And would it be positive uh, to behavior analysis to have a better communication between those uh, philosophers? I think it would be better, but uh, I think the benefit of that would be for radical behaviorists. I mean, I don't think inner behaviors are going to get much from radical behaviors because I think the field theoretical position is more advanced mm -hmm. um, than the causal construction. Uh, but, um, you know, radical behaviorism has been a foundation for a lot of um, applied um, psychology and a lot of basic research and But I think those, um, you know, those are the kinds of problems, and those are the kinds of issues that interbehaviorists haven't really dealt with so much. Um, and so some of that methodology, some of the apparatus, some of the strategies that behavior analysts have developed, uh, some of the utility of the things that they have found, uh, I think benefits the culture. Um, 
I don't think it has any benefit for the philosophy of science, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. The, the and, um, the, no, no uh, okay. Interbehaviorism have any important limitation? Limitation? Is that what you said? Limitation, yes. Um, you see, I'm just, I, I just love interbehaviorism. It's hard for me to come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the, the limitation is really in um, how widespread it is. Because these things, you know, if people don't have access to these notions, um, they um, it, it's not it's not something that is so um, seems so vital to the culture that it can easily just go away. Um, because the counters books are increasingly unavailable, you know, they're out of print and they're unavailable, and there aren't a lot of teachers who are teaching it. Uh, so it's it's base it's, its main limitation is lack of access to it. Uh, that's not a limitation of the system itself. I, I think the system is. Um, I have a couple of criticisms of the system. Actually, I guess I should talk about those. Um, I Cantor sometimes writes uh, had written that, and I talked to him about this. Had written that um, that history that history was sort of one thing and the present circumstance was another, okay? And to me, the, hist the present circumstance is the history. It's just an evolution of everything that's been going on. So you, you are your history in this moment. There's not a previous history, it doesn't do anything. You are that, you are that history, that your repertoire is just this evolving thing. So there's a little bit of sometimes the history, like in radical behaviorism, we say things like, um, well, something that ha ha some historical circumstances happened and that made this happen. Yeah. And we don't know what those historical circumstances, but that must have been what happened. Well, I don't like to talk about that. I, I like to talk about the history as being present. And the other thing that Cantor has said that, actually Cantor agreed with me on that when we had a discussion. But the other thing is um, the setting. What do we mean by this setting? I mean, what, what is the significance of this setting? And um, Cantor talks about the setting as um, as, as hindering uh, a, a particular interaction or facilitating a particular interaction happening. Okay. And for me, I don't like those terms. I think the setting is part of the event. If you change the setting, you've got a new event. You know, it's not that there's, it's a part of it and it makes something else happen. It's the whole thing, you know. So, and it's constantly changing as you're constantly interacting with the world around you. You're constantly behaving with respect to stimulation and everything you do is also changing the setting condition. The setting condition is part of the interaction. It's part of the whole thing. So I don't see the setting as, as enhancing something or facilitating something or hindering something. It is what it is. It's part of the, it's part of the thing you're looking at. It doesn't have any role or power or anything. So that's a slightly different um, uh, version of inner behaviorism, I guess. For me, though, thinking those things about the setting and the history is really the field. And I think if you start talking about something, some aspect of the field doing something to other aspects of the field, that's the wrong track. So. Right. And uh, talking about the spreading of interbehaviorism, uh, are there many empirical work based on this phil philosophy? Well, any empirical work could be analyzed from an interbehavioral perspective. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Um, it uh, uh, and uh, but and then well you have the issue that there aren't a lot of interbehaviors out there, okay. Mm -hmm. So I mean uh, so there's not a whole sort of 
an experimental group of interbehaviorists and a whole applied group of interbehaviorists. I mean, there are in certain places, like in Mexico and maybe in Spain and some other places. And, you know, my students do basic work and everything else. But, you know, you have to talk in a certain way when you try to publish those articles. <laughs> so right. You an experiment <laughs> and you try to publish that in a jam. Well, <laughs> they're going to want you to talk a certain way. You know, so, <laughs> so, um, so, um, there are, you know, in, in my own students for their dissertations and their thesis projects and some of uh, the other work that we do, we do talk as interbehaviorists as best we can, definitely the, in their theses and dissertations. When you then go to try to publish that in a, you know, behavioral journal, mm-hmm. you kind of have to sort of alter how you speak a little bit is they make it they make you do it <laughs> <laughs> right it's like uh, at other level but it it's uh, it remembers me to the um, the status of uh, behavior analysis uh, and psychology in general right yeah. it's like you have to talk in other words no you have to use other yes. words to be accepted right yeah. Right. So what do you think? Is, is that uh, what uh, occurs with behavior analysis in psychology? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, same thing happened with behavior analysis. I wasn't sure of your question. But originally, you couldn't talk in Skinner's terms. You know, they wouldn't publish that mm-hmm. also because of the methodology, uh, you know, within subject methodology. So they had to create their own journals. And mm-hmm. so they did. And the behavior analysts. They created the Journal of Experimental Analysis, the Behavior Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. And Cantor's journal was the psychological record. That's the journal that he started. And he was able to publish in there uh, many theoretical pieces there. Uh, and that journal has always been, it's not just applied or basic, it's a lot of theory, history, all kinds of things that journal. I, I, I think the Psychological Records is, is a great journal, really. Um, but again, you have to, um, the editor of the uh, Psychological Record prior to this current editor uh, was somebody by the name of Ruth um, Rayfeld, and she was a former student of mine. And so she kept up the sort of interbehavioral flavor of it. And now the current editor is Mitch Freiling, who is also a student of mine. So we're trying to hold hold, hold uh, that journal uh, as best you can <laughs> uh, with willingness to publish uh, interbehavioral materials. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I think there are Spanish journals, but <clears throat> the English are kind of limited. No problem. But... Uh, what, and what do you think is the weight of behavior analysis in psychology? I think it's... Um, I, I think the failure to deal adequately with complex human behavior mm-hmm. uh, is, is, is um, hurting its... Uh, value, you know, depreciating its value. And I think contextual behavior science, by by picking up on the stimulus substitution issue, um, I think that has meant that contextual behavior science is becoming more and more um, valuable or popular or known because it's focused on, you know, language and complex human behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, even though it, contextual behavior science is kind of a new version of radical behaviorism, dealing with complex human behavior, but still being a causal system. Mm-hmm. So it didn't go all the way. <laughs> it missed, missed the field notion just as kids. Um, <laughs> but, So I think radical behaviorism is still a, it's still a, um, you know, um, powerful uh, system uh, for application and investigation. I don't think it has anything valuable to say theoretically. 
Um, contextual behavior science has something valuable to say contextually, but it's insufficient. It's not big enough. It's not wide enough to include uh, matters of history, for example. Uh, the setting in contextual behavior science is kind of a, it's a, a controlling variable, you know, not, not part of the event that you're looking at. So there's some differences there. And, you know, um, it, it, inner behaviorism isn't going to take the place of all of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would be a good reflection for scientists in those domains to to know about. Mm. Right. Uh, talking about language, uh, what's the best theoretical approach to a study verbal behavior? Well, you know, I always liked Skinner's verbal behavior and I've taught that book for, you know, years and years and years. Um, but I don't, uh, but it's missing something really important as I'm saying. Um, I think that uh, Uh, Cantor's analysis of psychological psychological linguistics is important, but it's not a um, it's not thorough. It's not thoroughgoing. You know, it's uh, it's got some important uh, uh, distinctions between linguistic events and other events, um, but it doesn't go into a great deal of um, differentiation of different kinds of things. Um, Emilio's uh, analysis is uh, uh, very interesting, and um, I, um, um, Emilio has sort of has turned the uh, concept of the medium into uh, uh, a linguistic. Uh, a, a, it's, it's language that is the medium, and I uh, have talked to Emilio about that a lot, and I've read some of his papers and. I, I am not. I'm not convinced of that approach. Even though I think Emilio's um, understanding of a lot of things is is really um, fine and really important. And I think he's laid out some uh, a strategy for research that is largely based on Cantor's work. And I think, um, you know, I I think. Uh, the study of what Emilio has to say without some of the idiosyncrasies of it <laughs> would uh, uh, would be the best approach. And um, what do you think about cognitive theories? Um, do they always imply dualism? Uh, well, co cognition generally means, uh, you know, complex behavior like thinking, imagining, remembering, all of that, planning. Uh, if all, all we're talking about is those kinds of behaviors, you know, or those kinds of interbehaviors, there's no uh, problem with the concept of cognition or cognitive. But as soon as that becomes um, related to uh, parts of the organism, like the brain or the mind or something like that, then you got a problem. And that, that's not useful in my view. And uh, how will behavior analysis take into account those events like imagine and uh, remember? And what at um, an interbehavior dispute? Well, um, imagining is um, Skinner. Skinner talks about imagining or as seeing something in its absence. Okay. Um, so you're seeing an elephant, but there's no elephant here. Okay. Um, well, that is, um, doesn't make sense because from an interbehavioral standpoint, you don't just see, you see something, you know, you interact with something. It's not just an, a response with no stimulus. So it's just kind of, um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so that's, it's not very helpful. Uh, in terms of remembering, uh, Skinner talks about When you interact with the environment, you're, you're, you're changed as an organism, and it's the changed organism who now responds in new ways under new situations. So you have to take the position that interacting with in your environment and behavior being reinforced means that somehow you've got something stored in you that is your memory. Well, I don't buy that. You know, The brain isn't 
coordinating, integrating uh, organ, but it's not a storehouse of your memories. You know, it doesn't have a mind in there making stuff up and acting in all kinds of ways. It's just an organ. Um, so I, I don't think what I don't think radical behaviors have anything valuable to say about all that. Mm -hmm. um, and what Cantor has to say again, what he's talking about is again, it's this. It, it's the value of differentiating stimuli from their functions. So, you know. A, a stimulus has multiple functions by virtue of you having interacted with it in many different ways and in the presence of many different settings. So, you know, when you say that one thing reminds you of something, it's because that thing has some of the functions of something else by virtue of it having been in the same location at some time, by virtue of it being similar or, or something like that. It's, it's something that's happening right here, right now. It's not something inside of you. It's not something that happened some temporal time ago. It's 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 your current interaction with your environment, in, in current interaction with substitute stimulation in your environment. So that can explain a lot. It's a very powerful concept, and you know you can say, well, everything is that. Well, you know, a lot of things are that in that in that that in that domain a lot of things involve that um so i don't know a better way to look at these complicated uh, kinds of activities mm -hmm. yeah are you developing writing researching something now linda uh, yeah actually um my uh, former student uh, mitch freiling and i uh just finished um a book on interbehaviorism And it was sort of written as kind of an introduction because a lot of people were interested in interbehaviorism, but they always said, well, where do I start? How do I, you know, where do I, what, where do I read? So we have just finished this book. It's actually going through a process of editing right now, and we're hoping to have it available in a couple of months, uh, in a few months, actually. Um, but we've spent a lot of time doing that. And... Um, Oh, I don't know. There's various things out there on various topics. <laughs> If you sent me uh, some topics you're interested in, I could probably send you some behavior, some papers that I've written on on things from an interbehavioral standpoint. Right. Um, coming back to to cognitive sciences, uh, do you think that um, behavior analysis and cognitive science, um, maybe as a non-dualistic cognitive science, is, if that is possible, as uh, different levels of analysis and can benefit each other? Well, I think behavior, si behavior science, Skinner's behaviorism and cognitive science probably have more in common with each other than uh, either of them with interbehaviorism. Mm -hmm. Because cognitive scientists understand complex behavior by attributing various things to the brain. They're neuroscientists. And Skinner's radical behaviorism also attributes um, memory and thinking and other things, calls them private events. So if they're all talking just about private events and cognitive issues are just brain things and it's really material, it's not magical kind of thinking, it's not you know, the mind or you know, something like that. If they're all just talking about material stuff, they would probably get along pretty well. But from an interbehavioral standpoint, what what do you what does it mean? I mean, what part of the brain is are all your memories stored in? What, what you made that up? You made that up? There's no storage of anything in there. There's it doesn't make you do anything. I mean, in other words. We make up a whole bunch of stuff because we don't understand it. And we, we say the brain did it. And it's, it's located in the brain. It's stored in the brain. The brain thinks. The brain imagines. But from an interbehavioral standpoint, the whole organism acts in every circumstance. The brain doesn't act in and of itself as a controlling variable for the rest of the big old organism flopping around. Um, so the, the interbehaviorism is not... It's not that 
it's not that the brain is not a complex organ <laughs> that is involved in every kind of psychological event. It's just not a causal organ from a behavioral standpoint. So you don't want to put all the really difficult stuff in the brain thinking that you've explained it when you haven't really explained anything. So. Right. And what do you think are the main challenges that confront behavior analysis um, or that must, must be taken into account nowadays? Language. Yeah. Number one, because it's involved in everything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's the a, a, a well understood, agreed, studied um, understanding of, of language would, would be, mm -hmm. I think, is the most important thing there is to um, to look forward to to work on. And what do you think about uh, the research work that we have? Uh, we have had in the 10, uh, 20, 30 decades. <laughs> well, I think um, I'm not as familiar with all the work that is going on in, in uh, Mexico and, and Spain, just because I don't speak Spanish. But um, I do know some of it, and I think that's important work. Uh, I know some of the work that's going on in contextual behavior science, but it's kind of limited. You know, it's sort of match to sample this, match to sample that, match to sample something else. Still, it's important uh, to look at, at extensions of you know, repertoires. Um, Skinner's verbal behavior in terms of mans and taps and intervariables and all of that. Um, I think that's, um, I think there have been some good um some good uh, practical implications of his analysis of verbal behavior. Uh, but I don't think there's much, um, well, just like I said, I, I don't think it's an adequate interpretation of language. But mm -hmm. it's, it's mm -hmm. a useful, it's been a useful uh, uh, endeavor. Right. And what have meant to you uh, to have studied and have teach um, interbehaviorism and behavior analysis to your personal life, to your to you? How have lived you? Um, but it's funny, you know, students think sometimes that if they don't, can't figure out a cause for something, you know, they just want to know the cause. Students sometimes get anxious that they've got to figure out the cause. <laughs> and um, I have found a great enjoyment and great peace of mind. I shouldn't use the term mind. <laughs> Great peace. <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> As an interbehaviorist, I, 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 it's a very satisfying, uh, rich, um, uh, challenging, um, interesting career that I've had studying and teaching it. So I'm pretty happy. To conclude, Linda. A question that we always ask in this program is that what are psychological problems for you? What are psychological problems? The things that I'm working on? Is that what you mean? No. The, the definition yes. of the, psychological the, problems. Yes, the, What's the definition? The, the definition of, say it again one more time. What are psychological problems for you? The, the conception, the... Mm, I don't know if you understand me. <laughs> how how do you define a psychological problem? Oh, uh, well, it's um, it's a um, a particular um, type of interaction of the whole organism with the environment um, set in a. Um, a field of um, uh, many other factors uh, that together uh, uh, constitute an integrated field as a unit. So, and and if that's a psychological event, then all the other things that we talk about, um, walking and eating and running and thinking and imagining and dreaming and whatever, has to be understood in terms of a, an event of that sort. Hmm. So that's it. This is the end. Um, where are you guys? Where, where are you situated? We are in Spain. 
Uh, in Spain, are you? Marcos is in Madrid, and I am uh, in Barcelona. Now, oh. now I am in Segovia. I don't know if you know. Oh, uh, I had a student here studying with us for a while from Spain. From and, Spain. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, please, I travel a lot. So yeah, send me your email addresses in case I'm traveling to Spain this year. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course. <laughs> You'll be in touch. It's All been right. a great pleasure to have okay. you here. Thank All you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Gracias por ver este vídeo, os dejamos por aquí un enlace a nuestra última formación y por aquí algunos vídeos que os pueden resultar de interés. Si estáis buscando ayuda psicológica también podéis mirar en la descripción del vídeo donde encontraréis nuestra web y podréis solicitar asistencia.